children being at risk in the world today is a very important issue to discuss and to have conversation about. It's something that is very much on the heart of our Heavenly Father. And with me today, I have a special guest, Sarah Bowling, who shares the heart of the Father in this way. Uh, Sarah, it's so amazing to have you uh, with us. You, of course, are the apostolic founder of Saving Moses, which we're going to be talking about uh, today. But you're also um, a co-host, television host with your mother, Marilyn yep. Hickey, and you co-host the church out there in Colorado as well. Right. So you're, you're a busy woman as far as um, ministry goes, but you're also um, as an extension ministry and very much on your heart, a mother and a wife and, and a friend to many. So it's wonderful to have you, especially to talk about this subject. And you've written a book called Hanging by a Thread. And the, the, the cover, when I was looking at it just before we came on set here, um, it, it, it just moved me with emotion mm -hmm. because I have a heart for children at risk and for this subject, but this is the journey about how Saving Moses came into being and so many insights in that book on how everyone can get involved, that all of us are called and anointed yeah. to rescue children, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's so much darkness in the world, but God wants every child safe. Right. So could you tell our audience your journey, your story when you went to Ethiopia, what um, what was behind all that? How did you even plan on going to Ethiopia and what happened when you got there? Sure, and I kind of grew up doing mission stuff, pastor's kid, all that. And so um, I was leading a mission trip to Ethiopia and we were in, in a rural, not, it wasn't really rural, it was a remote city. Um, and we were doing like on an orphanage thing, we were doing a VBS, Vacation Bible School, and there was a, it was a big team and we were having a great time. And my neighbor who came along also said to me, hey, Sarah, did you hear about these babies, these newborns? They were abandoned on a field. Have you seen them? I'm like, oh. never heard of them. And he said, well, these newborns were abandoned on a field and the police called the orphanage to see if the orphanage would take them. And the orphanage said, no, it's not our policy. Um, but the police said, if you don't take them, we don't have any other recourse. We have to put them back on the field. Um, and so the orphanage is like, okay, you know, we'll take them. They're newborns, twin little girls. Their names are Sarah and Ruth. So this is my friend telling me the story. I'm like, no, I want to go see them, you know? And so I walked down the little path and, and I held these newborns, Sarah here and Ruth wow. here. I mean, little tiny. And I remember thinking newborns abandoned on a field and, and it just unraveled me. I was just flooding tears because I was like, you know, these are, lives are hanging by a thread. And so I asked the orphanage, I, and because I, I was like, how could you say no? <laughs> I don't, it, it just doesn't make any yeah, sense Especially to when me. they said it's not our policy. Yeah. No, yeah. that's a systemic <laughs> issue, right? It it's is. It's not our policy it to is. save dying children in the field. Yeah, okay. and, and that, I was, you know, I tried to not be rude and angry and, you know, hostile. I can only imagine the emotion that yeah. must have been going on in you at the time. Totally. And my eight-year-old daughter was with me on that trip at the time. And I'm like thinking, <gasps> you know, and so I talked to the director. I kind of calmed down and collected myself. And I said, hey, you know, can you help me understand this like policy thing? And he said, it seems like counterintuitive, right? Because we we're an orphanage. She said, but we made the decision early on in, in the founding of our, of our orphanage, we only have limited resources. And so if we want to help the most amount of kids, then we have to, with the least amount of resources, we then we have to draw the line with, with babies. Because babies take, and you think about it, well, a baby takes two to five times as much resource as a 10-year-old. Uh, no, way more people. Mm -hmm, exactly. Care, attention, medical, the whole thing. Yep. And so they said, you know, we decided. And so I started looking at that, and I was like, I found that generally that's true across the whole world. And then I found, I was like, well, is anybody looking after babies and toddlers? You know, and there's a lot of organizations that kind of will do some one-off projects. There's not one organization that was devoted strictly to babies and toddlers. And I was, I was like astounded. I was like, you can't be serious. I mean, I, that just didn't compute in my mind. Lots of stuff for kids and children and education and medical, you know, all this stuff, you know, shoes, which is all great, but nothing specifically zeroed in for babies and toddlers. And so that was like a bold new revelation. I mean, I and thought- And I'm sure that mm -hmm. is shocking to many of you. It was shocking to me when I discovered that. And I've been working in missions for a number of years and with children at risk, but I did not know that. Yep. You just assume yep. 
that when people are involved in missions work, especially with orphanage and rescuing children, yep. that the, the newborns and the young toddlers are gonna be on the top of the list. Yep, and they're not, they're not. And that was very unsettling to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, or like really unsettling, because when you think about it, like everything is a building block from the baby and toddler years, <laughs> right? So if you miss something of those formative, like, and that's worldview, that's also, met, you know, like brain development, that's physical health, yeah. all those things. The, and when you- Let alone the emotional mm -hmm. health. Bonding, attachment. Because the baby attachment. needs to be loved. They exactly. They need to be held. They need to be kissed. Exactly. They, yeah. And that attachment thing. I mean, so all these things are building blocks. So if you want to have some, you know, you don't want to deal, you know, remedy the problems. These are like preventative. Start here. Start at the beginning. And so that's kind of was my experience. I was like, <gasps> and it was just, you know, like epiphany. I want our viewers to engage in that experience right now. So I want you to take some time to think about this. These little babies are being formed in the womb. They're growing in a safe environment inside the mother's belly. And all of a sudden it's their time to be born. It is the expectation of all of us that when we're born, we will be loved, we will be accepted, we will be nurtured. It's built into us. God put that in us because when he created man, he said, this is very, very good. And we were accepted and loved and blessed by God. And so it's our expectation, even, even as a little infant, their expectation is when they come out of that womb that there's celebration. But for two little babies that are given birth in a field, and separated from the mother, someone had to cut that, that cord, and the mother walked away from the children. And they are left there with no nurture, no celebration, no love, nothing, just to die. No nutrition, nothing, no one to care. I want you to really just taste the reality of that. It just, it just grips me, it makes me cry. And children at risk issues, really make me emotional and I think it's because of the father's heart. Mm -hmm. He saw those two little babies in the field mm -hmm. and his heart was feeling the way my heart is feeling right now. Mm -hmm. But there's so many children that face that and in every nation. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and when I started learning that and discovering that, it really put something in me. I mean, there's grit and determination and, you know, that's unacceptable. And I had somebody tell me a couple of months ago, they're like, well, maybe you need to stop going, <laughs> going to these countries, having these experiences, because I was really emotional. I mean, really emotional and crying. And, and my friend's like, well, maybe you need to stop. I'm like, you're kidding me, right? I mean, this is the passion, the heart of our father and loving, kind, mm -hmm. compassionate for the least, the least of the least, yeah. like the most vulnerable. How can you, how can you not step? I, 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 I was, I tried not to be angry <laughs> with my friend, but I was like, you need to like reconfigure your, your what you're thinking here. Cause this is really messed up. Because your friend doesn't feel the emotion of it yet. I find when you connect emotionally with this, it never goes away. Mm -hmm. It never goes away. Mm -hmm. You actually cannot ignore it right. after you feel the emotion of it. Mm -hmm. But in the in the mind, you know, you can think, well, you know, mm -hmm. you can justify different things or right. whatever because it's not emotional. And I, I want you all to emotionally get this. I'm telling you, at God TV, we are on this. You know, we've always been an advocate for children at risk, even those who are not born. We are a voice, and so. I want you to be a voice too, but what will help you is if you can emotionally connect with this. One of the ways people can emotionally connect is be there, right? Mm -hmm. And you take teams um, I do. to your uh, different about, bases, yep, right? Yep, I do about once a year, take teams. And, and so we have something called night care mm -hmm. um, where we look after the babies and toddlers of sex workers in developing countries. And so that's kind of a, you know, we in America, we have daycare. You know, that makes sense. But night care is right. for, for the night time for these babies and toddlers. So I can bring people on that. We have yeah. an application process to kind of weed out sure. some of the strange people. Yeah, <laughs> but we do want to encourage you because we've got a go ye call on us. We are, it's not stay ye in all the church. Right. It's go ye into all the world. Right. And if we go to the most vulnerable ones and let God break our heart, I always find there's nothing like a good mission trip to break your heart once again yeah. with the needs of the world that are out there and knowing that we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. And with the night care, um, 
uh, we are very familiar with that because we work in Cambodia also um, with you know sex trafficking and and uh, workers in the sex industry and those who have been trafficked and working and a lot of times the mothers there don't have a choice right or they're not ready to flee the situation but their children are growing up under it right. so i so appreciate you yeah. and your teams going in there <laughs> and holding those babies, watching over them, praying over them, giving them what they need in the night, because mm -hmm. otherwise they are so vulnerable. And right. I know I know that you're probably not gonna believe this, but I've been involved in this, I've seen it with my own eyes, is that even infants, even infants are trafficked and infants are sold for sexual pleasure. I know that's hard to believe, but I know in Bangkok a number of years ago, this was actually on, on the news, is there was three Western men arrested for having sex with an infant. No. Yes, and so, um, oh my. you know, because of, yeah, I won't go into the detail right now because we, we don't need to, but of course it was a big splash, but there's a whole section in uh, Pattaya, Thailand, yeah. that is a children's brothels. I went there. Yeah, and people come in from all over the world. We used to work mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. People come in from all over the world to have mm -hmm. sex with children. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are, um, you know, physically disabled in that. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah. and they cannot, they, can't, they do not have a voice. Mm -hmm. We need to be a voice, but yeah. we need to be more than a voice. Yeah. We need to hold those children. Mm -hmm. We need to take them and keep them. And so what you're doing is so great because when the mothers are out working, yeah. when you're there, the children are not vulnerable. Right. You are protecting them. You are a guard over them. Right. And that is the most vulnerable time for them is at night like that. Mm -hmm. So oh, this is... Um, a subject that I have so much passion over, Hanging by a Thread. I highly recommend you getting this book because it will stir you to action. And that's what we need is more action. And I, I know that God will break your heart, but it'll also give you statistics and understanding that you need to be aware of this situation. And it's worldwide, it's everywhere, but also connect you with um, Sarah Bowling and her outreaches into the different uh, parts of the world that she's caring for children at risk and other outreaches too. I mean, you're an evangelist and so you do a lot of work everywhere, sure. but um, we're, we're, we're so grateful for you. But we're gonna take a break right now. God TV is very, very committed to seeing you equipped and trained so that you can be an able minister of the gospel, but also so that you have what you need to draw close to Jesus and to his heart. And so we'll be right back after this message. Well, welcome back as we discuss this very important and serious sobering topic of children at risk. And again, uh, thank you so much for hanging by a thread. What a contribution uh, for the world, not only Christians, but for everyone to understand um, this whole issue of these little little babies and infants that really need care. Your, your organization's name is Saving Moses. Yeah. I love it. And uh, can you explain to our audience how you how you arrived at that name? Sure. You know, um, honestly, it came out of a morning quiet time with God and just, just having some communication, conversation, fellowship with God. And God dropped it in my heart, the name Saving Moses. Said, oh, that's cute. That's really nice. Then I started thinking about it. I was like, wait just a second. <laughs> Moses was about three months old and his life was literally hanging by a thread because Pharaoh at the time of Moses' life had said, throw all of the Hebrew boys, little baby boys into the Nile River. So his mom's like, no, I'm not doing that. So she made a little boat of reeds, put pit, you know, pitch or tar on the outside so it didn't sink, and put him in the reeds of the Nile River. And his sister was watching along the side and, and little baby Moses, three months old, hanging by a thread, about ready to be crocodile food. Pharaoh's daughter hears him crying and picks him up out of the reeds and raises him, saves Moses. And you're like, oh, that's such a sweet story. And it is, it is, it's very heartwarming. Absolutely. However, the real, like you start thinking about it, if she had not done that, if we think about Moses today, he wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. Yep. He did like 
like Egypt, bringing Israelites out of Egypt. He was a deliverer for a whole nation. Exactly. We have the Ten Commandments. We have Mount Sinai. We have the parting of the Red Sea. We have the tabernacle. We have the temple because of Moses. Yep. So his life at three months old is literally hanging by thread. And if you hit, if he had been crocodile food, where would all that be now? Right. We, we, there's a good chance we would not have any of that when his life was hanging by a thread. So the idea that this is a little baby, this is God, God's gift to us, we have no idea who that baby, God's design and plan, blueprint in that little baby. We don't know. But at the core of us, not only do we want to do that for the potential that God has, but just out of the sheer heart of the Father, love, yeah. genuine love, that God loves, we are loved. And because we are loved, and we don't just say it in our mind, a mental ascent, rhetorical answer, but we know that to the core, that in the deepest part of us. And I would say this for our audience, some of you watching right now, you don't know that God loves you. There's a coldness in your heart. There's a callousness. There's kind of a, a just an objectivity. And I just want to speak to you right now that God loves you deeply. You're like, yeah, baby, but you. And in Romans 5, verse 5, it says, The love of the Father is poured into our hearts through Holy Spirit. And I pray for you right now. You're like, well, this is really passionate about babies and toddlers around the world. But God is passionate about you as an individual. Mm -hmm. God cares and loves for you. And my prayer for you today in this moment is that you experience and know the Father loving you. Not because of what you've done or haven't done, not, but just because of you, for who you are, for your core, true, authentic self. God loves you. The Father loves you. Wow, so powerful. Mm. I'm getting a word also for uh, some of you that are watching. You actually were rescued yourself. Um, you were adopted um, by loving parents. Um, you were uh, maybe rescued from being aborted. Uh, I'm just getting in my spirit right now that uh, one of you is, is a survivor of an attempted abortion because of an intervention that came there. And God wants you to know that you are saved for such a time as this, that your life is precious, your life is beautiful. And uh, we're so grateful for those that are active today, helping to rescue children's lives and their, and their destiny. Now, what are three things that most people do not know, and this is covered in your book, yeah. about um, saving children from harsh environments? I think number one is the idea that, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, that these are building blocks. And so when you have a baby, everything is building on what that baby gets at that time. So their physical stamina, strength, all that. So if a, there's a baby that's malnourished, right. then a lot of times that malnourishment Im impacts their development. Absolutely. You know? So they don't their their skeletal structure gets compromised, yeah. the size, the muscles, and their learning capacity. Exactly, their mental abilities. Yeah. Those are all like those are building blocks, and yeah. we take it for granted because we're just assumed. But if something doesn't get, if you don't have proper nutrition, proper, right. and not only that, but also emotional connection, attachment with a mom. Yeah. And so when we have babies that are in sex trafficking industry in that environment, mm -hmm. there's some real real struggles, attachment challenges, you know, babies that have moms who are addicts. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I had a little girl of mine that is still to this day, she gets in my heart when I think of her name because I just, her mom was an addict and her mom, Patricia, her mom would not let her come to our night care center because when she was three and four years old, she, her mom used her to sell condoms mm -hmm. to her clients. So she would make money off of exactly. her. Exactly. And I just, so, I mean, these are bonding attachment issues. I mean, connection with your, so these things when we're babies, like the impl the ripple effect of that is really. It's really mm -hmm. something, isn't it? I remember when we were in Patea and we did a lot of, uh, you know, we would find a lot of the victims out on the street, right? Yeah. The children that, that were at risk. But this one little girl, um, she would perform every night till oftentimes four in the morning on, on the strip there. Okay. And it, it was like she would dance and everything, but you could tell she was high. And so we went and talked to her handler and um, really kind of read the riot act. And it turned out to be her grandmother. No. Her grandmother sold her daughter, her granddaughter into that. And she 
wouldn't let go of it because she was making a lot of money. Like people would put money in the pot to see her dance, but she became so seductive and you could tell mm. that she was used for more than just dancing, that she was being used more. And um, it, was, it was such a tragedy. Now the good thing is we were able to get that child rescued um, but then two years later, somehow she got back and she was older and damaged. That's mm -hmm. why we have to get them when they're babies. Right. We have to get as many as we can. Right. Like, let's rescue all the babies, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. that they have a chance. And that's what you're doing by mm -hmm. giving babies when they're in mm -hmm. that real young formative mm -hmm. place, just, you know, mm -hmm. the chance that they need. And they're the highest risk. They're at the most vulnerable t stage in their entire life. They can't speak, you know, they can't defend themselves. Right. They can't protect themselves. There's, and the atrocities that happen with babies. And I just think God is passionate. God is passionate about life. Right. I mean, very steps in and says, no, draws a line, no, no, no more. And so I think when we feel that passion, it's the Father working and, and moving in our hearts and compelling us, hey, no, I'm not, I'm gonna do the best I can to make a difference and stop and, and rescue yeah. and redeem and protect and do justice, the whole thing. I mean, that real strong, intense, I'm standing in the gap, not, not over my dead body, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. I believe God's going to mobilize an army of people who are going to really care for children at risk on every level. But I, I believe that a great tool to really set your heart in place and to give you statistics and things that you need, even on an emotional level, would be to get the book hanging on a thread and also to go on Sarah's uh, website, Sarah Bowling's web website, and find out more about saving Moses and what they're doing. Now, you mentioned nutrition, yeah. which is really important, and your organization is helping in that area too, right? We do. We have um, six malnutrition clinics in Angola, and then we also do malnutrition, a malnutrition clinic in Congo, the east side of Congo, and so that's really powerful. Yeah. That And, and what I see there is, um, and I the little first baby I met, little Belito, He's now about 10 years old and so sweet and full of life, you know, and vivacious. And But his life, I remember his mom had him and, and she was he was just coming out of the malnutrition clinic, but he had, he's decimated by the malnutrition. And when you see what happens when they get proper feeding and proper nourishment and all that and the turnaround, they can phenomenal. build up so quickly too, mm -hmm. right? Yep, exactly. Sarah, you've seen so many um, different things. I mean, it must break your heart every time you come back from a trip, mm -hmm. you'll probably have to process and even get the Lord to minister to you, I'm sure. But what is the most impacting story that you've ever been involved with? Not only the child, but the mother as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really powerful question. I think one of them, one of the most impactful is the little girl I talked about with her mom who was a, a drug addict. And uh, the very first time I met this little girl, she was just sitting outside in the dark, outside of a miniature brothel. And she led me into the brothel. She was about two. And I, did, I came to realize later her little brother was swinging in a hammock, just a, like probably three or four months old. And there was like an, a functional <laughs> brothel that was going on, like real time, at, you know, clients and everything. And I'm just green as a day is long. And that little girl, I got to know her over the course of a couple of years. Um, and I would go and talk to her mom and, and implore her mom. The mom let mm -hmm. the baby come, her little brother, but the uh, brother later was killed, run over by a car. And so when mm -hmm. I talked to his older sister, I said, wow. you know, where, where is your little brother? He said, she, and she could see she just got sad. and. Just talking to her and even asking her later as she was a little bit older, you know, do you, because her mom died from drugs. And I said, do you miss her? And she just got cold and hard. And I was like, you know, how, how does that happen? How does that happen? And I thought, you know, Holy Spirit, let your love pour through me so that we have transformation and redemption, that this doesn't have to be normal. Right. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is it gives us hope is that we are not powerless. Right. We can do something about it. And when I first got involved myself into anti-trafficking issues and that it, it looked like such an enormous issue, I thought, how can we do it? And the Lord simply said, just with the one in front of you, just take that one and do what you can do in your sphere. And I wanna leave that word with you. I wanna invite you um, to just get hold of Holy Spirit's heart in this and to give him your yes to being a solution to the problems. And so we release the anointing of God over your life to go and to be a light, to be his hand extended, to be his love in areas where 
where there is no love, where there's only hate, only abuse, only rejection. You can be a light. So we just anoint you. We minister to you. We bless you. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in and through each one of our viewers, because we can all do something. You can do something. You really, really can. So thank you so much for joining us on today's program. And I know that it's been enlightening for you. And we will see you next time. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know how it impacted you. Send your feedback, testimony or prayer request today. Or ask Patricia a question for a future program. And don't forget, you can continue growing in the supernatural with our premium e-courses. Connect with us at god.tv Patricia and join us next time for our next episode of Supernatural Life.